Yours Evans, you know, the famous Dutch documentary filmmaker, had been asked by his government in San Francisco to be film commissioner for the Netherlands East Indies when they were liberated from the Japanese, which occupied Japan. And he said, why you take me? Because I, I make uh, uh, Indonesia is a colony and the trade unions aren't allowed to be formed. And, uh, you know, I make films about liberating uh, the people. And uh, so the Dutch government said, no, 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 this is going to be according to the Atlantic Charter and so on and so forth. So we went to, Euros went to Australia where the, where the uh, headquarters of the uh, Netherland, Dutch Netherland East Indies government was, was stationed and the, the ships, which were, in, which were in, in numerous. And, uh, and uh, so we waited, the, the war with Japan was still, uh, was, was, had not been finished. And uh, eventually uh, the war had ended and Indonesia declared itself a republic, just like that. Yet here in Australia, it wasn't just the river and rice fields, the villages of their homeland they thought about, but something they didn't have before the war, something they fought for with the Allies, independence. The voice of Indonesia calling. The Republic of Indonesia has been proclaimed which shocked the Dutch out of their, their wits, and, and they didn't want a republic. They had been thinking of giving small uh, privileges to the, to the Indonesians, but certainly not. They wanted to keep their rich colonies. So, so, so they, they went to try to get their ships back to Indonesia, with armed and to, to attack along with the English fleet, the, the Indonesian new really formed the republic. At which point, Yoris said, who was supposed to go in with the first ship, said, I, I, can't, uh, I can't fulfill my contract. I'm supposed to make a film about liberation, and this is a film about repression. So he quit, had a big press conference, and, and uh, made the New York Times because he was the first Dutch official to, to leave on, on political grounds. At any rate, there we were in, in, in Australia, with nothing to do, Yoros had to give back his beautiful cameras and all his lovely equipment. And, uh, and at the same time, things were happening on the waterfront. No, said the Indonesian seamen. We won't man your ships. We won't carry arms to be used against our own people. Here's our answer. Direct action. They left the ships. They walked off the wall. They quit the offices. Soldiers refused service. They got together with Australian wharfies right here on the docks while the big ships waited. They spoke in a language workers in every country understand, of bad conditions, low wages, and what those 350 years of Dutch colonial rule had meant to Indonesia. The news spread, and waterside workers came from other wharfs to listen. Finally, it turned into an impromptu meeting. That's when Australians had their say. Indonesian seamen weren't allowed to form a union till they came to Australia. We helped them get organized, and now we can't let them down. We can't scab on fellow workers. What about the Atlantic Charter? We are committed through the World Trade Union Congress to support freedom for all nations. Why not Indonesia? Their spokesman asked for just that, our support for Indonesia's struggle for freedom and self-determination. Well, it's up to us. Declare Dutch ships for Indonesia black. Dutch couldn't get anybody to man their ships. And the, and the Australian um, waterfront workers uh, declared all Dutch ships black. Meantime, things were happening along the waterfront. There were the Indonesians, there were things happening. Yours, it, it was a place very hard to get to because it was very much watched after the war. Uh, the waterfront is a dangerous place for, for, and highly policed. So I went as an American uh, cameraman, camera lady, 
doing a film on tourism in Australia. So I got away with it a little bit, and I did some shooting, and and things really began to happen. The, the ships were the uh, the Dutch ships were really blocked, and and it became a very dramatic story. Indonesia calling uh, developed in front of our eyes, and and uh, Yoro said to me, "Well, you just got to go out and shoot." I had a small Kinamo camera that that does 75 feet, so every 75 feet you have to stop and wind it up again. It was, and we had bits of film that pals had given us that had come back from the jungle. We didn't know what we were shooting with. Kodak didn't want to sell us films. So I don't know why. At any rate, uh, we, 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 we did what, what happened. Yours kept pretty much behind me because if he were picked up, it would have been uh, big news, you know, Dutch official uh, uh, shooting clandestine film. But in Australia, there was a horrible situation. Anybody could get five quid who saw something happening on the street for the newspapers. The, the newspapers wanted so they could call up and say, a man is beating his wife, and the, and, the, and, the, and the journalist came in five minutes. So every place we shot, uh, we were in danger because somebody would say, oh, people are shooting a film on my street. At any rate, it was, that was one of the dangers. The camera was one of the dangers. The fact that it was clandestine. We, we had meetings with the, with the trade unions, with Jim Hilly of the Waterfront Workers Union, of the Sailors Union, and, and with the Indonesians who were grouped. The Indonesians uh, were happy that there was a republic in their country, and, and they knew it was in danger, and they were, some of them were politically developed. So, so we worked with those people. And we shot. We didn't know what we were shooting, but we shot everything that happened. As Federal Secretary of the Seamen's Union, on behalf of the trade union movement of Australia, I present to you this flag. Take it with you to your young republic as a symbol of the support of the Australian workers in your fight for independence. Good. In the name of the Indonesian Republic, I thank you for this flag. We will never forget the great help Australian labor has given us in the vital first days of our Republic when we need that help most. And may Australia and Indonesia be united forever. Indonesia Merdeka! Indonesia Merdeka! <laughs> So all the ships were, 18 I think, were blocked in Australian harbors, ports, and, but one ship got away, one ship got away. There was an Indian crew on board and the, and the owners of the ship said they were taking medical aid to, to Borneo. And, and, and a, little bo a little motorboat goes out after this big ship, it's very dramatic. And they, and they say, brothers, brothers, don't take this ship. This goes going to Indonesia, explain anything. And the Indian seamen come back. So it's, a, it's got a dramatic story. The Dutch had sneaked it through by putting an Indian crew on board. Our boys didn't have much of a cruiser to go out and do battle. They didn't have any guns or ammunition. But they had words. And they were talking to Indian seamen, Indian brothers. Indonesia's fight for freedom is your fight. Join us, fight in neighbor. Louder, they can't hear you. Brothers, turn the ship back. Indonesia's fight is your fight. Go on, call again, it's not too late. Brothers! They've gone. But outside the head to the throb of the engine, the Indians were thinking, Brothers, Indonesia's fight is your fight. Stop engines. Stop engines. The, the reenacted scene was the scene of the Indians going out on a Dutch ship. This happened at night, and we were told in the morning. So we had to shoot it. We had to shoot it in daylight. So we had some, by accident, some shots of Indian seamen 
you know, leaning over on their on their elbows in port. And we took out, we got a motorboat and another motorboat, and in the one motorboat was an Indian, was an Australian seaman, and uh, some somebody from the trade union, and they they uh, and they called out to the Indians, brothers, don't take arms to Indonesia. Take, bring the ship back. Brothers, brothers, don't, and they spoke in Indian, and it's very dramatic, and we were pulling, pulling the, the boat along, the boat with the, the ones who were crying out, and trying to keep, keep in line, and trying to, to, to get back and forth, and, and, and we showed the ship, which went out. So we lost, we, the ship has gone. So it was, it was reenacted, really. The trade union movement, the Waterfront Workers Union gave us a few dollars, a few quid, and, and we got a little bit of money, and we, and we made the film. We made a copy, and it was shown in, in the Stanley Theater uh, uh, for several weeks. It, it, it was the first, well, first place, it was the first anti-colonial film ever made, as far as I know. And secondly, it was, it was lively and dramatic. They've come back. The Indians have come back. They've done it. They've stopped the ship. Come on, this really calls for a celebration. I found a record, a disc, a record that you could use by paying the record. You could use the music for nothing. And we had Peter Finch, who was a, Australia's greatest actor and later went to England. It was a very well-known actor, Peter Finch, uh, read the commentary, which was written by Catherine Duncan, a highly talented radio author and playwright and knew how to write scripts. The film cost nothing uh, except the sound recording, which was t uh, two afternoons of sound recording for two sound scenes, and then later the, uh, the sound, the commentary recording. But it's the kind of film that young documentary film makers can make. They can make it. We did it with nothing, with proud cameras. Well, I think we have 25 uh, meters of film, and the film is 22 meters, as you can imagine. Our, we're, we're, our cutting room was owned by a man called Murph, and Murph said, if Evans can make a film out of this, I can make Ben-Hur in my backyard. <laughs> but the film holds up.